What goes wrong if we try to please people all the time? That's what we're going to talk about today. If you're trying to please everyone, then you're not going to make anything that is honestly yours. Viggo Mortensen. Yay, Lord of the Rings. Today we're going to talk about people pleasing and what happens when you're too nice or too available to just try to please everyone. And the basis for the conversation is going to be anxious to please seven revolutionary practices for the chronically nice by James Rapson and Craig English. That people pleasing has been a problem of mine forever. I do people please. I try all the time to make people happy, to do things to make their lives better. But I also think that people pleasers can make the world a better place by making other people happier. And the book goes into the point that people pleasing and being kind and being nice to other people is not the problem at all. The problem is when it goes and starts destroying our own life. He says that it can lead to self-esteem problems, depression, problems in your relationships, and even it talks about, you know, the workplace. And he went through it with one point. But the thing I noticed is Jill's always dependable. Jill is always dependable. She's always the person who comes through when something needs to get done. Someone needs to stay in the office overnight. Something emergency has to happen on a weekend. I am. I am absolutely a dependable person. But am I too dependable? or too nice? That's what we're going to talk about. So he said that you might be a nice person, and it talks about a long list of things, that you worry so much that it seems normal, that you often don't even know what you want, that you try to second guess what other people are thinking. That's a big one for me. I will sit there when I'm driving and think, okay, would the people in my car prefer if I took the country route or take the highway route. Get there faster or get there nicer? I don't care. So I'm thinking about what they would think is the better way to go. So I'm always trying to second guess everyone else's point of view. Constantly apologizing. Frequently doing favors for people, but you hope that they, it says they will reciprocate. Feeling sorry for yourself. I mean, the list goes on and on. We can keep going about this. But he says that people are nice, you know, for the most part, most people are. And we live in a world that tries to get people to be nice. Our schools try to teach people to be nice. We enjoy nice people when we go to work. I always tell people to try to be the kind of person you would like to work with. So if you like to work with nice people, as I like to work with nice people, then you try to be nice because that's the way to do it. But sometimes we go too far and we stop understanding ourselves. We start feeling compelled to be nice when we maybe have something more honest to say, or someone needs to stay late at work and do this project. Maybe that weekend you had something planned and it's not really appropriate for you to stay and help it out. Yet you are the first person up and volunteering to do so. So maybe your people pleasing is causing you to miss out in your own life. Maybe you get anxiety when you can't help people or you fail to help people. You're too concerned about what other people think or you are ignoring your own happiness to try to go out and make everybody else happy. And then he even gives you one at the end, which I thought was interesting. He says that you don't really know where you're at with your own anger or aggression. You're just so into people pleasing that you don't have that ability to get mad anymore. And then I think to myself, well, why would someone need to get mad? I don't get mad. And then I'm thinking, oh, I don't get mad. That's exactly it. I'm not someone who gets mad at anybody. But maybe there are times when you should, that potentially there's a problem there. The book says that we look at people who are nice. It says as benign. Boy, there's a, there's a word right there. You know, benign just means there, like a nicely potted plant, right? They don't help anything. They don't hurt anything. And it says at times, a passive aggressive behavior can come out of us. So when we feel that we're put upon, we can't be mean. We can't be argumentative. We can't say something or dominate the conversation. So then we get passive aggressive. And then people start to think of us as that. 
That's no good either. And he calls it even an epidemic. You know, I don't know. I wonder about that. Do we have an epidemic of people trying to be too nice? I don't know. Sometimes I think people aren't being very nice at all. So that's a very weird question. But he gives the quote, and I liked, always like this quote, of what Thoreau said, that most people live lives by a desperation. They're just not happy. They're just not happy with their lives. And instead, they are doing things to just make themselves desperate, quietly so. And so what they want to talk about is how can you get out of that circle of quiet desperation or being too nice or too anxious all the time about what other people are thinking. They give some reasons at the beginning of the book about why over niceness happens. And one of them was having a bad mother-child relationship. You feel disconnected from your parents. You don't feel nourished or encouraged or cared for by your parents. And so then you cling on to other people. Boy, that was me. It's not that my parents were mean to me, but at, when it came to friends, I relied on them too much all the time. Or sometimes it's, he says what he calls a disorganized attachment. And that happens when it's not malice or it's not a parent being purposefully distanced. It is that the parent is just so all over the place. You never get the emotional needs that you have from them. Maybe that's more the situation I have. My parents actually were both most times, very kind people, very nice people, and at times very loving, but they each had their issues that I couldn't count on it. If I had a serious problem, I'd come home, I'd immediately judge the situation. Are we at a time when I can talk to my parents about whatever situation was going on with me? Ooh, dad is super drunk. Well, I guess not. I couldn't count on them really for many things. And so that became hard for me. But the other part of it too is that my dad, drank and was aggressive towards my mother so that I felt that I had to make her life happier. I, I tried to cheer her up. I took her out to events with me so that she would be happier, so that she wouldn't just be stuck in the house all the time with this very aggressive husband. You know, that maybe she could hang out with my friends who are very nice people too and just get a little fun in life when she just was getting none. I ended up being the clown, the one who told all the jokes because I was the one to make people happier. And I don't dismiss that or even think that that was a bad tactic to take. And I'm not sorry for any of it. If I made my mom's life happier at all, I am thrilled with that. If I was able to be funny with my friends and make well, stressful times less stressful, I am perfectly happy with doing that. The problem comes in, I think, at this point is that we deny it. We bury ourselves. We become what was used to be called a walking doormat. I mean, people would just step all over you all day long. I was the person who let people all the time step all over me. I was a nice person. And you know what? I was never going to say a word about it. So helping someone like my mom was great. But when people took advantage of that situation, which they often did in my past, hmm then that it's problematic and it's become something I really shouldn't do. He also, in this book, mixes it up a little bit with feelings of anxiety and guilt. You know, maybe you don't please the person and now you feel guilty about it. Or you're anxious to, to make that person happier and you get a lot of stress that what if I can't make this person happier? I tried my best. I mean, I was just a little kid when all of this was happening. And I learned the next part from a book because, of course, I did. I did the best I could. I knew I was just a little kid and that there was only so far I could go. And that, in some way, I think, protected me from the anxiety part of it. But that can come with a, a low self-esteem, that I'm not worthy to be friends with people unless I tell a funny joke, make their day, be the class clown. And when I was around popular people, I think in high school, I felt that I had to be the person in yearbook who took everybody's picture or got everything that they needed or help them with their homework if we needed to do some tutoring situations. That's how I got people to like me is, you know, by just being incredibly helpful. And again, I don't regret it. I like being helpful. I like having a podcast and hopefully helping all of you. But in some cases that he talks about in this book, people get anxious, get resentful. They get self-esteem problems. And, and, and overall, they get fatigue. They get exhausted by this situation. And so then 
they can't keep going on anymore because they're just tired. Luckily, I think I have never gone or at least haven't recently gone that far anymore. I have learned in the past ah, probably 10 years to say no. Once you start saying no, then you get really good at determining when you should say no and then doing it. But in this case, this book he's talking about is that these are people who can't say no. And so what do we do? How do we get people back from the brink? And he said that the first way to do it is to just bring awareness, understand and recognize when you are being too nice. I think for me, that absolutely was the first step was not correcting the behavior, but saying, you know what, Jill, you did not have to be the person who stayed late to work to get this done. You know what, Jill, you did not have to be the person who broke down and just gave in. You could have put in your voice to go to the restaurant you wanted to go to. After all, it was your birthday or something like that. And guess what? Most of the time, people aren't asking you to do these things. You are doing this to yourself. Just started to recognize those times where mm, I wasn't standing up for myself or I went too far in not standing up for myself. So I agree. Absolutely correct. So they say that you should look at the situation, identify what behavior it is that you did to be too nice, what emotion was tied up in that, and then if you had any thoughts associated with them. You know, so for example, I stayed late at work when I didn't have to stay at work. What was my behavior? I stayed late at work until midnight and, and got this haul done by myself. What is the emotion associated with that? Well, you know, guilt. Everyone else, you know, have families. They had things to do. They probably didn't want to stay late. It, it's fine. It's fine, right? There's the emotion right there of their time is valuable, mine's not. And then the thought is, yeah, Jill, you do this and, you know, protect anyone else from doing it. As soon as you start recognizing these situations, then you'll start being able to figure out when you go too far, when you've done it too much. And there have been times where something came up and I saw it coming a million miles away and I literally sat there with my hand over my mouth. Don't put your hand over your mouth while you're doing a podcast, by the way. I literally sat there with my hand over my mouth, preventing words from coming, leaking out of my mouth because I knew that I would say, oh, it's fine. I can stay or it's fine. We can go to where you want to go. And I would sit there with my arms on a table with them literally planted on my face to prevent words from escaping my lips. That was the first step. You know, the more you start doing that, you get better at saying no. Or maybe you don't say no, but you would say, if there's a number of people who are willing to stay, I'm willing to stay too. Because if we got a group of four of us to do whatever project it was, we'll get done in one quarter of the time. And then each of us are spending an hour instead of me staying here till midnight each of us are just here maybe for one or two more hours and we all got it done together. So I don't think you even have to say no. You just don't have to fall on your sword to the extent that people do. The next step, he says, is to forgive yourself. Start with the idea that you're not going to be hard on yourself for doing this or the time that you lost. You're going to get patience for yourself. And I think, too, you have to realize changing behavior Changing this pattern, small steps. It's going to be small steps. It's going to be that first day you didn't say, yes, I'll stay late at work and do this thing. It's going to be small steps in, hey, I've always wanted to eat at that Mexican restaurant on the north side of town. What if we went there? Okay, we didn't eat there, but I, I did it. I said it. I put out the suggestion. Gosh, heck for me. I did one of those like Patreon-like accounts, the Buy Me Coffee system. I've had it on the show notes of this website for over a year and a half, and I cannot get the words to come out of my mouth to, to say, use this. I shouldn't ask for money. I shouldn't, you know, do those kinds of things. It's hard for me. It's going to take small steps for sure. The next step is, he says, is called something called the desert practice, which is where you seek some isolation. But you also provide for yourself so that you have some basic needs. He said, like, cool water, a nice place to sit. You are starting to draw yourself a little bit so that you can practice being nice to you, not worrying about other people, not focusing on other people. And so you're going to have a physical space. 
You're going to you're going to set yourself aside away from people a little bit for a limited amount of time and you're going to just do things for you. You're going to be focused on you. I think that's one of the things I do when I go camping by myself is I'm so used to picking things that other people like, what you want to eat or where do you want to go hiking or what do you want to go see or what kind of hike do you want to be on? When I go camping by myself, I have learned the lesson of picking for myself. So even drawing myself away, even though I don't want to be away from my friends, helps me learn to know what my voice is all by myself. And so I think this desert practice has a lot of value to it where you can whisk yourself away and do what you want to do. Live the life you want to live. No, I live the life I want to live. I know who I am now better than I used to. And I'm more vocal about saying it to friends. Sometimes I will even say, because they know I'm an overly nice person and that I often smother what I say. And I'll say, you know, if it's left up to me, I'm going to say, let's go someplace new. And then I leave it out there. So it's, it's a step forward, a small step forward. Now, because I learned about myself, I like eating in new restaurants. I like trying new experiences. That's the thing with me. I usually don't care where I eat or where I go. I just want it to be new. But when I'm by myself and I have that desert practice of solitude, of listening to my own voice, I get what I want every time. And that's the fear in this book, that even when you are by yourself, you aren't picking the things you want to do. You lost yourself entirely. And he says that when we're there and we're practicing this solitude, we can challenge ourselves to do something you really always wanted to do. You can be intentional. He says, you know, either have structured time where you have a plan of what you're going to do or a little bit of unstructured time. But either way, you're always going to do what you want to do and make it a regular thing. Make it, a, he said, a consistent part of your life. Not just that you do it once in a while, but that you do it often enough so that you can hear your own voice. I think it's so valuable because when we have other people's voices in our heads all the time and we're people pleasers, it is hard to hear our own voice. So doing this often will introduce you to what you sound like. And then he says to have a personal ethic, not just what you want out of life, not just the things that you think you should have, but what is it that you think is the important ethical thing to do? He gives this in terms of what he calls a warrior. A warrior has personal ethics. A warrior has the ability to tolerate intense emotions, he says. And a warrior can take action, which follows both the heart and the ethics. And so giving the example of you see someone, snowy day, I live in the Northwoods, right? Someone is struggling with their driveway. They, they're incapacitated in one way or the other. They can't get their driveway open. So my first action is I'm going to go over there and help that person and, sh and help them shovel their driveway. And he says that the nice person thought, he has a little chart where you break this down, a nice person thought or the warrior thought. If I help that person, they'll know what a generous person I am. They'll know what a kind neighbor I am. The warrior thought is instead, I believe in helping people in my neighborhood. And I'm going to help this person because I have the time to do so. If I didn't have the time to do so, I would decide I didn't have to time. I would decide I couldn't, but I can right now. Instead of it being a default decision, instead of you feeling beat up into a decision now, because of your heart, because of your ethics, because of your mind, you are deciding something instead of just falling into niceness. And he says that what we have to do is break down our automatic reflexes. And so what's my automatic reflex? Oh, I'm going to help someone. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to stay late. I'm going to be the person who just says, oh, let's just eat anywhere you want to eat. I'm going to always be the, the walking man because that's who I am. Instead of find out whatever reflex you have. I thought that was so good. And stop doing it. Find out whatever reflex you have and just examine it like it was a bug under a microscope. 
what is this automatic reflex I have? Why do I always say at work, I will be the one to go do this? Then what emotion is there? Well, I like to be Jill, the reliable person. Everyone always thinks of me as reliable. I have to keep myself being reliable. And then to have compassion for that emotion. Yeah, Jill, I know you want to be the person who always does the thing. The world doesn't fall apart when you're not that person. You know, something like that. That piece of advice is great. And then make sure you don't get overwhelmed with emotions. Give yourself time and space. And then when you're ready, that's when you're going to bring that warrior out of you and you're going to start working out decisions instead of feeling guilted into it or instead of doing automatic reflexes, you are going to decide, where's my heart? Where's my brain? Where's my ethics? And then start acting on that. And when you do decide to help people and be incredibly nice, you're going to do it because it is one of those options. And it is because it's the right thing for you to do at that moment, too. And he gives at the end of the book three mindsets to have. And like I said, if you are interested in this and want more information, absolutely read this book. He goes into a lot about the anxiety of being too nice. That didn't feel like my problem. But I could understand how it would be many people's problems. He says, one, that we should be cool, that we shouldn't just be on this emotional roller coaster all the time, that we shouldn't be pleasing and apologizing and trying to beg people to be our friend or whatever it is. Just be cool. Be calm. Number two, be clear that you don't have to be a martyr. You don't have to save the world that you don't have to cut off your own desires in order for you to be a hero, he says, or to, to be the one who saves a bad situation. Instead, you can look at yourself as being responsible for how you manage your time, your resources. And then if you do the thing to help someone out, again, it's because you've decided to do that. Setting boundaries, you know, sometimes protecting yourself from doing that. I noticed that when I got roped in to doing things, it was because I was the person who stayed late. And so when these crises happened, they always happened at 6 p.m. And I was not a morning person. I've never been a morning person. So I would be the person there at 6 p.m. And that's when all the crises happened. I noticed that if I worked at the regular time during the day, crisis got more dispersed to everybody because then the boss would have to call people Hey, Bob, you know, do you think you come in? We're having a crisis with one of the customers instead of, oh, Jill's right over there. In fact, I had a coworker get somewhat mad at me because when I stopped working late, suddenly everyone else on the team got called and she wished that I would go back to working late so she didn't have to come in late. That was telling to me that I wasn't just being helpful. I was being taken advantage of. There are ways that you can set boundaries and limits so that you're not always the very first person to be picked. But then the last one, he says, be kind. I worried at the beginning of this book that by not being nice, are we saying we're not being kind? Are we not going to be the person who helps shovel the neighbor's driveway? Are we not going to be the person who makes your mother's day because she's had a rough time where her husband is being kind of a jerk to her? Are we not going to be that person? We can be. We still can be a kind person. We just don't have to give everything. We just don't have to give until we're depleted. We just don't have to be the person every time who does that. I think that's great advice. So my challenge to you is, are there places in your life where you feel kind of a walking doormat? You get run over every single time. It might not be about everything, but it might be about some things. Can you write down that situation where you make a chart of the situation, the behavior that that situation made in you, the emotions behind what it is you decided, and the thoughts. Sometimes those thoughts can be very uncomfortable. If I don't help my friend move, she won't like me anymore. You know, something like that. But get honest about some of these people-pleasing emotions and see if you can't stand up more like the warrior following your ethic a shogun and instead of being a doormat. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and 
you can buy me coffee. The links are in the show notes. See what I did right there? I did it. Second time I've asked for for the buy me coffee, but you're always welcome to if you find value from this podcast. And remember, instead of being a walking doormat, we can be a warrior, a nice warrior, by taking small steps.